So the little presentation is called Graphic Identities, the idea being that we are starting with graphics or images and we're going to create or transform them into the identity of your show. Or we're going to take it the other way around, which is to understand the identity of your show, target graphics, and then turn it into something that's logo-like. Now I've got a little graphic up here of a number of the logos that you're probably familiar with from online purveyors of uh, <laughs> services, mostly. Um, YouTube, MySpace, Amazon.com. And if you look at it, I think pretty quickly certain ones stick out, right? So which are the most familiar to you? Google. Google, okay. NBC. All right. McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> when you look at those, what are the elements that are in them that make them up? Colors. Colors. The fonts. Fonts. Right. So most of these logos are, are font-based, which means they're logo types. I mean, they are only using the font to create the identity. It's about as simple as it gets. It's like your name, right? And stylizing your name. Now, most importantly, when we look at or think about a logo, is understanding your brand. What is the purpose of, like, for example, your show? Who is the audience? What is the visual culture, right, of that audience or of that genre? And then figuring out how to craft something that looks or reflects that brand, that intent. And the things that you're going to work with are the elements of font, some shapes, some colors, and some icons or graphics, right? Kind of within the realm of shapes. Now, we all know what that is, right? You just do it. Yeah, and who's the company? Nike. Nike, Nike right? <laughs> so this is about as simple a logo as one could come up with. Anybody know what it symbolizes? Motion. Okay, motion. Check mark. I mean, it is the check mark. It's the wings of the Greek god. I can't remember which Greek god oh, now, though. Hermes. Hermes. Oh, Hermes, thank you. Hermes. Right? And this was done by oh, a woman designer, a female designer whose name, of course, I'm blanking on, uh, for $35. <laughs> but in that $35, it indexes or references that history of super speed and of motion. I mean, those two things alone, that's one idea. Super speed, fast, right? Then later on, they came up with the whole just do it thing that we all like relate to so easily. So again, that's a logo. When you add the typography, of just the typography, it's called a logo type. And then a couple of things that I want you to think about. So number one, a logo needs to be reproducible. Initially, you're all worried about, well, how's this going to look on the web, right? But it also needs to be able to translate. So if, for example, you're at a screening or something like that, and they want to throw your branding, your logo, onto a poster at that screening, you need to be able to put it on the poster. And somebody needs to be able to photocopy it in black and white cheaply. And it still needs to hold up. You also want to be able to throw it on a t-shirt. Let's say your production expands, and you want to have you know, crew t-shirts. That's awesome. You want it on the t-shirt. You also want it to be t-shirtable, which is uh, a technical term for something that people would want to wear on their t-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. I think that's always a good sign that you're, you're there. So here we go. Here's a logo and a logo type together. right? So the logo type, the typography, what's that say to you? Digital. Digital? OK. What else did it say? Uh, OK, the, the logo itself has that 3D quality. Mm -hmm. But let's just focus on the typography for a sec. What does that say? Like a <coughs> fun, entertainment-based thing, even if I didn't know what the actual console used. OK. So why does that look fun? Play. OK, so yeah. what it says, right, yeah. gives us a sense of fun. Why does it look digital? OK, but what about it? Uh, it's it almost looks like a typewriter kind of digital computer base. OK, so it's, it's like really regular, right? Like yeah. all the strokes are pretty regular. And it's very geometrical boxy. and boxy. Yeah. And then there are these points where you've got these weird breaks, where it's like, you know, like between the T and the I and the little A, there are all these like little almost squared off breaks, which look like a pixel, maybe. I'm just throwing it out there. So here we've got, even just in the logo type itself, an expression of something. 
right? It's not just like written in random thought, but it's actually designed and considered to express something about the identity of the company. Then we've got the 3D thing, right? The 3D mark. You got the P and the S, but it's in the 3D space. Why, why is 3D important to PlayStation? Because it mimics reality. Because it mimics reality, right? These are semi-immersive games if you're into PlayStation versus Xbox. So good. So here are the things you need to think about when evaluating an effective logo or identity. One, it needs to be describable. So if you were telling your friend about it, saying, hey, you know, I just saw this show and they've got this awesome logo, you need to be able to say what it is. I mean, what do we talk about McDonald's? How do you describe their logo? Golden arches. The golden arches, right? It's almost like it's their tagline and it's their logo. How awesome is that? Um, I'll, I'll keep from the editorializing. So it has to be describable. It needs to be memorable. What is McDonald's logo? The golden arches, right? You already got that one. So you remember it. You know, if I say Nike, what's the logo? You're going to be like, oh, it's the swoosh. Right? These are things that are within our cultural memory that we all share, if they're effective. It needs to be reproducible without color, which is why I'm showing these things in black and white and not in color, even though we often see them in color. And it has to be scalable. In other words, if you want to put this thing on a billboard, it needs to be, look awesome. And if you want to put it as a little bug in the corner of your show, it needs to look awesome there as well. Right? So here's our McDonald's. Yeah, pretty effective. And I'd also just point out with McDonald's here, you know, sometimes you just see the golden arches, but here we have the type with the golden arches. And you can see just, I guess you'd call it like the hierarchy of the typography, of the name. It's Mick and then Donald's, right, somebody's name. So we got the Mick, which stands out in its own space, and then Donald's, the D lines up with the arches to help give some of that structure, and it continues on out. So it actually has a decent amount of motion. You've got the golden arches, and then you've got the McDonald's. If you thought about how you might even want to animate that stuff, it becomes kind of apparent that there are many ways of doing it, but even just drawing this thing on and then sliding in the McDonald's would be a really nice way of fitting it together. It's built for motion, even though I'm sure they didn't design it that way. <coughs> so what do we do? How do we evaluate? How do we do anything that we don't know how to do? Right? I mean, a lot of you started off as independent producers of stuff, maybe without a lot of formal training. How did you figure it out? How did you figure it out? Research, Research right? All oh, right. Whoa. All right. Research. So you find good examples of things, of the things that you're interested in, right? You may not know why it's good, but you know you like it, and that's an okay place to start. But then you have to go through a process of deconstruction. So you go like, all right, well, why are they good? Why is this good? And then you find stuff that's bad, and you're like, oh, why is that bad? Like, why am I responding to, like, I would never want that on my show ever, right? And how do you do it? Well, we go back here, and we say, all right, these are our criteria for the good thing. Is it describable? Yeah, well, how do I describe it? And how do they make it so that I can describe it? It's memorable. Okay, well, why is it memorable? What about it do I continually go like, oh, yeah, that was cool. Like, I liked the way that that thing swished. And it's a unification of the idea of speed, and it's on my sneakers. And you know, you got the whole Greek god thing on my sneakers, which is cool. And then, you know, the reproducibility and scalability. Same thing with the bad stuff, because you want to target, like, what's really bad. Because what you're trying to build is an awareness of the criteria for why things work. Right? It's very DIY. So I grabbed this from another guy who does amazing uh, logo design. So these, <laughs> these are his graphics, right? We got the Nike, which is the good. You've got that thing in the middle, which is like, oh, embarrassing, right? It, it's a Center for Asian Studies, believe it or not, but I'm sure that's not what it looks like to you. <laughs> and then you get the thing that completely doesn't look designed at all, right, where it's A, B, S, Advanced Vision Surveillance, and it's all over the place. And they've got, like, this crazy icon of, like, cameras twice for some reason, right? <laughs> so here are your basic rules for how you put it together. And I put together some basic rules. There are no photos in a logo. They just aren't. You can make graphics that are photographic or that use photographic elements. Logos need to be far simpler than a photograph. Two, never more than two fonts. Ideally, one font. In fact, all the stuff I showed you so far, one font. But never any more than two fonts. And for sure, only one, unless you're going like for the wacky kind of kid 
weird font where you're, uh, what would you call that? Um, uh, ransom note, right? If you're doing a show about ransoms, then maybe you'll do like multiple fonts, but it's part of a visual culture. Other than that, no more than two fonts, shoot for one. You need to do testing. You need to test for scale and reproducibility. So as you print this stuff out, you print it out on your super hot printer, make sure you run over to Kinko's and run it off on like the oldest, nastiest black and white printer they have and make sure it works, right? Test for scale, make it small, make it big. And it sounds really obvious, but I can't tell you how many times people be like, yeah, this is an awesome logo, and they've got too many colors going, and we reproduce it black and white, and because the colors have essentially the same value, different colors, like you know, red and green, they look really different, but when it goes black and white, it looks like just a blob, right? Don't be trendy, because I'll tell you that right now, anything that's trendy won't be trendy a year from now. You want to say one thing, not I thing, that is a number one. Say one thing and one thing only with your logo, with your brand. You can only message one thing, one feel, one idea. And then also, especially when you're starting off, avoid gradients. I know you'll look at, or if you've done any looking at tutorials for making awesome logos, often those tutorials now are showing all sorts of gradient effects. Mostly because they're web-based companies and they're not thinking at all about Hey, I might need to put this on a t-shirt. I may need to make business cards at some point. I may need to put this on a poster. Gradients are difficult to reproduce. They can be used, but that's typically where you want to bring in somebody who has, an ex has experience with printing to understand that technology. So here we go, you know, our McDonald's again, local company. Describable, right, the golden arches, an M. It's effective without colors, right? So when we take out color and just go with value, it's still a strong enough gray to hold up. It's memorable, everybody knew what it was. And really small, it still works. In fact, you probably don't remember this, but they used to have like little drink stirs, hot coffee stirs, they'd have this tiny little M on top of it. You'd be like, oh cool, it's a McDonald's M. Right? It was almost like a toy when I was a kid. <laughs> That's what we had for toys. Um, so here's our design process, right? Because this is really important, right? You understand, you're, you're thinking about like, well, what's good and what's bad, but then how do I apply? How do I make my own stuff? And often, how many of you jump right on the computer? Anybody? Anybody like a noodler? Jump right on. Don't do that. Don't noodle. So our design process begins like this. And this is really typical. You can research it on, you know, look up logo design, design process. And this is what you're going to get pretty much every time. You need a design brief. You need to do research. You need to do a sketch or prototype. You need to refine and you need to publish. So what does that mean? Well, your design brief is where you describe in writing what your intent is, who your audience is, and you may even do some general writing, some free writing, but that can also be under research. So some of this stuff blends. So your brief, this is what my brand is, this is what it states, this is the intended audience, and this is how we are going to go about capturing it in a graphic. Two, research. Well, research can come in many forms. The way we're gonna do our research today is to find images that relate to your writing, but we're also going to do some free writing. So our free writing today, which is how I like to start my students, is when you have an intent, you write like associated words. So what emotions, what age groups, what colors, what textures, what objects relate to your show. So if it's a show about cooking, you know, maybe it's like fruits and vegetables, but maybe it's a grilling show, so it needs to be like grill tools and burgers. Right? These are the objects. Well, what are the colors of a grill? You know, fire, red, orange. Right, what's the temperature? Hot, right? So we do that sort of thing to come up and narrow down what the scope of our search is, right? Because that's all you want to do. You want to narrow this down because if you start with just like opening up Photoshop, there's a big blank page, you're like, ah, where do you start, right? <coughs> so we do that research. Then we sketch and we prototype. And typically like with a logo, a real identity pro pro uh, process, we're probably looking at 25, 50, 75 sketches to then narrow it down to 10, to then refine and narrow it down to five, to refine and narrow it down to three, and then you present that to a client if you're a identity designer, right? And when you present it, you're presenting it with black and white, large scale, small scale, colors, right? But we're not doing that. We're, we're just, we're stripping it all down as a process, but just so you know. So you sketch and you prototype, then you refine, you finish it, and you publish it, right? And so on the right, I just have some other like logos that I think are fairly effective. We've got Adobe, right? Adobe A. 
that Drobo logo type. What does Drobo say to you? Anybody know what a Drobo is? Right, what does that say to you? That's an interesting one. What do you think that company is about? A robot that draws. <laughs> robot that draws, okay. So you're reading, but I, I'm talking about the form. Like, what does it look like? Is it? It looks playful. Playful, okay. Is it a tech thing? Is it a entertainment thing? Is it entertainment? entertainment? Okay. So it's a little bit friendly. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So a Drobo, just so you know, because maybe they're a little bit off, is this box right here, and it's a, it's a large hard drive array. But it is meant to be just like a box, like you pop in hard drives and you don't think about it. So it's supposed to be very user friendly for, you know, like kind of people like me who don't want to set up servers. <coughs> Peach Pit Press, you know those guys? Anybody ever hear of them? Linda used to publish her books on Peach Pit Press. Logo, right? What's the logo of? A peach, right? Single peach. Super simple, right? Not photographic, no gradients, would reproduce really well. Could be very small, could get huge. And then on the bottom, black magic design, that's, that's actually pretty not great. And the reason it's pretty not great um, are a couple things. One is the design gets hard to read, so we lose it because it's such a light color versus the dark color. But then these squares don't necessarily mean anything, right? I don't even mean metaphor. It's like they're not even, they don't even seem connected to the logo type. Like they could just get away with black magic design without the three squares. There's no unity, it doesn't hold together. So we get into design principles, right? So we have a process. So what is it that we're kind of looking for, thinking about as we put these things together? Typically, these would be your design principles. It's, it's almost a half hour into to, to our time together, so I'm gonna move through it kind of fast, but these are the principles. Balance, rhythm, proportion, dominance, and unity. So balance, as we select images and try and make them work can be the idea that many elements or multiple elements are working together something big something small but within a composition it still kind of holds together so if i have a rectangle and i take a big circle and then i take a black circle small one that can actually create balance right i mean they're not symmetrical it's not even equal but you can use that as an example of balance because one balances out the other, because that's a lot more dense than that is light. Rhythm, right? I can create simple rhythmic patterns even just by doing something like that. So graphically, we can create rhythm as your eye moves across something or through a composition. Dominance, coming back, to, or proportion, right? So we talked about proportion in terms of scale. But dominance here, maybe it's an area of focus thing. So maybe if I do something like that, which one are you focused on? This one, right? So this becomes the dominant element. You typically want something that's dominant and something that's subservient um, within a composition so that you're, there are areas of focus. And then unity, making sure that it all holds together. So these are general principles. I just want you to be aware of the concepts and we'll talk about it more as we look at your stuff. <coughs> also, just a real quick kind of recap. These are the top Fortune 500 logos. So often companies are building logos so that they represent their brand so that they can sell stuff and make money, right? These are your top companies. Not necessarily the most imaginative and amazing and slickest logos, and yet they're still making lots of money. So, but when we look at it, they're fairly simple. Most of them rely on typography first, and some I guess they're more an expression of ideas. So here, let's look at Bank of America, right? Typography, pretty bland, pretty, pretty transparent, I would say, right? But what about that mark? What does that look like to you? It's like uh, fields. Fields, and what else is it like? Flag. It's like a flag. So it's like them saying that they are, America. they are America, right? That's a pretty bold statement. AT&T, what are they saying? <laughs> we are the world or we own the world, <laughs> depending if you have an iPhone or not, right? Exxon Mobil, this one's harder. What's that saying? Gas. Why is it saying gas? Because the double X yeah, it's, it's like running over. Okay. 
Yeah, and they're using they're using a a version of Helvetica, which is a font that in the mid-century was very popular in corporate America because it was very transparent and systematic. It felt very organized. I don't know if anybody's seen Helvetica. The, yeah, you're like, yeah, I saw that. So the, there's a documentary called Helvetica. I totally recommend it. But again, it's part of that tradition. Ford? What's Ford saying there? Like elegant sort of. I don't know. Just oh, be like classic. Keep going. Classic. Okay, why does that look classic to you? It's got that kind of like vintage cursive look to it. Cursive. Okay, and where do we see cursive? Um, older time stuff, I guess. Back when we used to write with pens. Yeah. Right. So, so it's about the handwritten. You're, you're dead on, because you know this doesn't look so cursive, but you know this is old school. Uh, What's that called? Penmanship. So it connects to the past, but also connects to the personal. Good. So then again, you know, we don't have to go through each one of them, but they are communicating something. And again, they're not trying to tell you the world. They're just trying to tell you like one thing. Awesome. So we do have some technical considerations as we begin, as we're going to transition into actually making some stuff. So Photoshop, beginning skill, anybody? Beginning, intermediate, advanced, oh, god of Photoshop, anybody? Any gods of Photoshop? Yeah, exactly. All right. Illustrator, anybody? Anybody ever open Illustrator? Okay. We're going to work in Photoshop because it's a little bit easier, but typically logos and stuff that you want to reproduce really big and really small is done in Illustrator. And the reason is, is that there are two ways that we make two-dimensional graphic images in, in, in the world at this point. One is called raster, and the other is called vector. Photoshop is about rasters. In other words, it's pixel-based image making. Every pixel has a value. If I say, hey, a pixel over here, because it's just a grid, right? If you ever look at an old TV, like really, really close, and you see all the pixels, right? maybe like late on a Saturday night, you're just kind of like, Whoa. So you see all the pixels, right? So each TV, just like every raster image, I'm just telling you, I had a lot of boring Saturday nights, <laughs> right? It's basically a grid of pixels. And if you remember geometry, you know, you've got your x-axis and your y-axis, and it's, you know, you count them. One, one, two, three, four. And if I say, hey, pixel number four, four, well, what's the value there? Well, in a raster image, it has a value. It has an RGB value, RGBA value. So with alpha, it's like, hey, it's blue, and it has some transparency where a vector is mathematically derived. So, for example, for example, if I were to draw a circle in a raster environment, this isn't going to be a very good circle, but we'll make believe that I'm drawing something that resembles a circle. There's my circle, right? So in Photoshop, each one of these guys has a value. These are black values, those are white values, and I get something that approximates a circle. In Illustrator, and this isn't exactly true, but this is the underlying metaphor. A circle in Illustrator is pi r square. Anybody remember geometry? Pi r square, right? It's mathematical. R being radius, right? The radius. Am I getting this right? Right? That's r. Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes I get these things wrong. So. And because it's mathematical, I can say r equals one pixel, which would be super microscopic, or I can say r equals one mile, and the application will draw it and it will always look perfectly smooth. You never get this kind of stair-stepping, which is typically, again, when we're dealing with the world of graphics, you want to be in this world because you don't know if it's going to be on a billboard or on a t-shirt or on a bug or whatever. But we're going to work here. Anyway, because it's a little bit easier <laughs> to start with. And I'll show you how you'll transfer from one environment to the other, because you can use Photoshop for sketching and then move some of that stuff into Illustrator. But when, I'll open up Illustrator once, and I'll just close it back down so we stay within one world. <coughs> so those are the differences loosely between Illustrator and Photoshop. Now, Photoshop has changed a lot. I don't know how many years you've been using Photoshop, for those of you who've been using it. But it used to be it was completely raster, but now there are some vector elements in it, so it's even more confusing. Awesome, right? <laughs> Two, because we're going to be working in Photoshop, 
actually it's number three, but really it's my second thought. We're dealing with resolution, right? Now, the biggest resolution that you will be outputting for video is what? HD. HD, okay, which flavor? 1920 by 1080, right? Which is a 16 by 9 ratio, so 1920 by 1080, and that's 16 by 9. <coughs> Using this model, right, the pixel grid, so we got 1080 pixels vertical, 1920 horizontal. So we're going to work, we need to make sure that whatever we build is big enough to look good at that size. Right, that's the goal. We know what our output is. <coughs> so, and then also when we're in these applications, remember, these applications are used for print, they're used for web, they're used for television, they're used for film. So we have different color spaces or different color methods that are employed by those different industries. And I don't have graphics for this, but I'll just tell you. So you all remember Roy G. Biv, right? Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, so on and so forth. Right? That's your color spectrum. How we reproduce the color spectrum that humans can see typically falls into two camps, RGB or CMYK. RGB stands for red, green, blue, and that's what we use in, for TV monitors. So by combining red, green, and blue, when you put all those together, you get white. When you turn off the pixel, you get something that approximates black. If you're lucky, it's really black because you have a nice TV. If you're like me, it's kind of gray. But you know, that's just how, how it is. So RGB. In the print world, we use CMYK. Cyan, which is like blue, magenta, yellow, and key, which is black. And by mixing them all together, you get black. So that's how we reproduce stuff. Both of these applications allow you to be in both color spaces, but you will have weird color shifts if you do not make sure that you're in RGB because that's where you're outputting to. So find 10 items using the Google search or the Bing search um, and make sure that the dominant element can be extracted. In other words, if I want a microphone and I really want to be able to use the shape of the microphone, make sure somebody's head isn't in front of half of the microphone. You know what I mean? Make sense? Cool. All right, and then I'm going to go into this Photoshop demonstration. So let me show you what I got and then we will do your search. Since I pre-searched my stuff, I came up with a show called Love Ship. I know, you may have heard of it. I, I am breaking a couple of rules here, and this isn't the font that I originally chose, because my fonts at home are different. But this is what I started with, okay? So, I don't know if it totally holds up to all of the criteria. It is reproducible. It does work in black and white. Let's see if I can make it black and white. So it's black and white. So it works in black and white. It would probably work really small. Let me see if I've got the right. Oops. No, I didn't flatten it yet. Um, it would probably work small or big. And I could also extract the typography, the typography from the icon if I wanted to and come up with something that still was recognizable because that totally looks like a skateboard. I love ship. No, it looks like a ship though, right? I mean, it kind of looks like a ship. It's a love ship. <laughs> I don't know, it was late. Um, and then I also brought it really quickly. Yeah, it's a donkey. It's an ashtray. I quickly brought it into um, into after into Illustrator rather, just to throw it into like a graphic circle. This is not good. I would say that that's not good. But I just wanted to do the translation that I will then show you later on how to translate into uh, into Illustrator to make everything vectory. So how did I start? And what is Photoshop? Well, this is Photoshop. So I'm going to get rid of all this so it's not confusing. Um, or at least I'll minimize it. <coughs> this is a JPEG. I got it off of Google. Uh, it is copy protected, so I do not have rights to this image. I, I would like to tell you that um, Voitech sent me to the Caribbean to, for a photo shoot. But unfortunately, that is not true. So I got it off the web. Now, when I open up Photoshop, this is kind of what I see, all this stuff. And what I'm going to do first is I want to set, kind of reset it for you. And maybe we'll do it even like that. So it's closed. I'm going to open up Photoshop so we can see what opens up. It's CS5 is what we're using. If you have CS4 or CS3, it's all pretty much the same. There aren't huge differences for the type of work we're doing right now. Um, 
So the first thing I like to do when I'm working in Photoshop or any new application is go over to Window, Workspace, and reset whatever the most basic workspace they have is. And the reason is if I'm new to any of these environments, it's kind of like being new to a building, right? You walk into the building, somebody says, hey, you're gonna be meeting in 709. You're meeting in 709. Oh, by the way, if you need the, the water fountain, it's around the corner, right, by the elevator. And oh, by the way, the bathroom is right next to it. You don't wanna come in every day to your classroom or to your building and have it be on a different floor, in a different location, with the bathrooms and everything rearranged. And that's essentially what happens in these software environments when you're in a shared environment like a computer lab, because I'll use it differently than you use it. You might like move your palettes around, and when I open it, it doesn't even look like the same application again, especially true for After Effects. So again, window, workspace, um, reset, essentials. Awesome. So what I get when I reset the essentials is a set of tools on the left, some of which probably look familiar iconically. Or, and if you're in the back, you might want to move forward so you can see all this stuff. Because I'm going to show, and then we'll do, and then we'll work back and forth. <coughs> so in the first show, uh, it's probably better just to be here. So uh, yes, and one of the beauties of Photoshop is that you can roll over your tools, and they give you the proper names. The Move tool is one of the best ones because you move stuff around with it. Uh, but we're going to be spending most of our time with this thing called the pen tool. So more of that in a sec. In addition, any tool that you bring up, that you click on, brings up a contextual menu. So a menu of options that you can use with that tool up at the top. And then finally, I knew there was something else I wanted to see. Ah, yes. Some tools hide. So if you've been using Photoshop for a while, you may say, hey, but this new version, I can't find, I don't know, the paint bucket tool. Well, it's hidden. So anytime on one of these icons we see the little arrow, it means that there are more options underneath it. So it can get confusing. I mean, every year they come out with a new version and they seem to move something around. So how we start? Well, we're going to file, open, and I'm going to navigate over to the desktop where I've got my stuff open up my JPEG, and hit open. Now, if you were on Bing or on Google, you'd option click, save it to your desktop, or save it to your folder, and then we'd reopen it in Photoshop. Now, we typically want to do a search for a large image, and I'll go through that process before you do your searches, um, just so that we have decent resolution. Well, how do I know what resolution I have in here? Well, under these top menus, so we got the main Photoshop menu with plugins and preferences. We've got the file menu, which is typical on most applications to where we open things, we create new, we save, right, or print. But when I go over to image, I can go to image size. And this will tell me what the pixel grid is. 1659 by 1106. That's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty close to HD. Pretty close. Close enough. <coughs> so I'm here. I've got my JPEG. So the first thing I want to do is I didn't talk about this, but there are many different types of digital images. Each type of or flavor of digital image is based or defined by the type of compression used to create it. On the web, we typically use JPEGs for photographs or PNGs for photographs. For graphics, we use GIFs. But in all of those file formats, we can't use layers, which is essential for Photoshop work. So we want to save this in Photoshop's native file format, the PSD. So we go File. Save as, and then in here, where you save it, very important. It's going to give me a number two because I already have one in there. And what do I save it as? I'm going to save it as a Photoshop document right up here. And I'm going to hit save. And maybe I won't do that. Let's go three. And save. Most important thing to do is save your stuff in a place that you know where it's going to be, especially when you're on somebody else's computer. God forbid you like log out of the computer and it erases when you log out, and then you come back and you have no work. So always save where you know it is. <coughs> Once we're in here, I will just point out a couple things. One, um, these are our layers. Photoshop works in a top-down layer method. So if I throw a bunch of typography on there, like blah, blah, blah typography, and if it is right here on top of that layer, we see it first. But if I put it under, actually, let me duplicate this layer. If I put it under this layer, it disappears, right? So it's a top-down logic, which is similar to Final Cut, 
obviously similar to After Effects, similar to Illustrator, but it's not similar to all applications everywhere. So you just want to know that top down. I can grab and move and change the stack order of these elements, which is also very useful. Now one of the things you might notice is right here, I've got a little lock icon because the background of your Photoshop document, when you bring it in as a, when you bring in an, an image, uh, like a JPEG or a GIF, and turn it into a Photoshop document, the background is always locked. I have two ways of getting around this. One is I can double click on it and turn it from the background into an actual layer, which then turns the lock off. Or if you're like me, what I like doing is I just duplicate the layer, I grab down here, and I go to that page PLE icon, page peel icon, which is new layer. And because I'm grabbing this layer and putting it onto the new layer button, it gives me a duplicate of that layer. Now the reason I choose to do that is that it means that I always have the original image in my Photoshop document in case I screw something up. Because everybody screws stuff up. So it's always nice to just be able to go, oh yeah, I screwed it up, all right, now I'm back. And just duplicate it again, okay? Serious. Happens in After Effects too. <coughs> so let's do a couple things. One, um, down here, the icons that we have in our layer area are, or the things that we can play with in layers are opacity. I'll just show you that I can take the opacity down. I can play with uh, locking stuff if I don't want to mess with it. Always a good idea. Um, I can lock position instead of lock everything. I can lock the image pixels, also useful, and I can lock transparent pixels. So I can select what I'm locking or not locking. I typically just deal with lock all or don't lock all. I keep it simple. And then there's the fill button, but we're not even worried about that so much. Now down here, what I do want to show you is that we have, um, these are your effects. Don't worry about those because we're not using them. We have layer masks, which we're actually not going to use down here, but I'll show them to you in a little bit. We have adjustment layers, which allow you to create adjustments or changes to attributes of your images um, in a non-destructive way, which is cool. I'm going to show you that in a second. And we can create groups to organize things. So let's go into adjustment layer. And I'm going to go into adjustment layer. And some of you, this may seem familiar to some of the stuff you can do in Final Cut to change attributes of your video. This obviously in After Effects, we have essentially the same stuff going on. Um, but I can use adjustment layers to do things like create a solid color. Um, so let's do that. Let's pick the solid color. We're going to make that white just so I have a nice white background. Now I can't see the white background because it is behind the image, but it is there and we will use it. So I'm setting that up, right? Also, as you work in Photoshop, it's really useful to label stuff. Um, so color fill, I'll just call that white, even though it looks white. It's a good habit. Here, ship. Good. <coughs> Next, I want to turn this black and white just to get a sense of what the value structure is of the image. I do that by creating an adjustment layer for hue and saturation, believe it or not. You get this little icon here which is my adjustment layer icon, and it is going to affect everything underneath it. There's a way of making it affect only single layers, but let's just deal with it affecting everything. If I click on that layer, it gives me this adjustment panel above it, and I can take the saturation all the way down and make it black and white. Often, especially for, for images that you're getting off the web, colors are wonky anyway, just make it black and white. It's just easier to deal with. All right? Good. So we got that. So an adjustment layer affects everything underneath it. I'm going to get rid of this text. So by selecting it and hitting delete, I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm going to show you, like, again, as quickly as possible, the easiest way, I think, of making an icon. So we're going to go to the pen tool. Now, the pen tool is a vector-based tool, meaning I'm making what's called a path, a mathematical set of shapes or a mathematically defined shape um, that then I can scale up, scale down, move into Illustrator, or whatnot. But I'm using this photograph as the template. I'm going to trace, essentially, over it. And it's a pretty cool tool. So I'm going to go click, and it sets the first point. Can you see that, where it sets the little square down there? Good. So what's cool about the Bezier curve, or about, rather, yeah, one point at a time. Um, What's cool about the pen tool is I can use Bezier curves. So right now, I'm clicking and holding, and I've got a little straight line between, can you turn off the light all the way down, just so it's a little more apparent? Cool. 
And you can turn the side lights up a little bit if you want, just to so people aren't falling asleep. There's a switch on the bottom. Oh, there. Yeah. All right, cool. So you can see that there's a little, um, what do you call that? A little line between the two points. And if I click and stretch, click and drag rather, I can start bending that curve. So I'm going to bend it so it follows the curve of the ship. Next. And I'm going to do this a little bit rough, but I'm just bending and clicking, clicking, clicking. If it's a straight line, I'm not worried about bending. I can even be a little bit rough with this just because. Click so those are all straight, and I'm getting to a curve. So I'm going to go to the end of the curve if it feels like I can do this, and I'll do a little bend. Although I went too far. Option Z. I want to go here. So a little bendy thing. Come up, come up, come up, over, over. If I want to zoom in, I can also use the Apple Plus to zoom in. The space bar gives me the grab hand, so I can move that down. And you can see that there are mistakes in here, which is awesome. I'll show you how to fix them. And I'm going to simplify the form just so that it's, I don't know, better, simpler. Because I know I don't need all of this detail. I'm going to zoom out. Oops, zoom back in a little bit. Grab hand, so space bar. Click, click. Bezier curve a little bit. Go to there, up to here. So click, 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 right? So all these cool clicks. Probably should have gone straight across there, but whatever. So and hopefully what will happen is eventually I'll be done with this. <laughs> I'm just going to go actually, I'm going to make this much simpler so that we are faster. So we can get to your stuff. Click and click. And then the last one, I come over here and I close it. I get that little circle icon. You see that up there? Boom. Now I have a path. Well, wh what? What's a path? Well, there's a path channel here, and this is called a working path. I'm going to double click on that so I can name it. Ship. And this way, I'm saving this information in the Photoshop file. I can always re-access it, which is really useful. Because if I go back here, actually, I need to use my, I'm going to use my pen tool. Yes, no, let me think for a sec. Now I'm going to go over here and use my arrow tool. And I'm going to use a selection tool. This is my path select tool. So if I click on it, it highlights all of those points. But there's a mistake. Where was that mistake? The mistake is up here. So if we look up here, you can see like there's that really weird bend. Well, that's not good. So I'm going to use my direct select tool, which will let me select. I'm going to select off and then select on so I can grab that one point. And then I'm going to grab the end of this. Oops. I want to grab the other end right here of that Bezier curve. And I'm going to take it in. Boom. And then come back up here, fix that. And we'll say that that's OK. See how I went in and fixed it? So the, the white arrow lets me select individual points and individual sides of the Bezier curve. So for example, again, this is like if you can do the Bezier curve thing, you're it's awesome. So if I have a point here, that's my point, and I've got a line. And once I have the Bezier curve handles, right, the default for the Bezier curve handles is they're at 180 degrees from each other. And all I'm doing is it's like stretching a, uh, a piece of sheet metal. Uh, I'm kind of like bending it and distorting it. So putting more or less pressure on it to create greater or smaller angles. But if I only want to bend one side, I use the white arrow tool. Oh, it kind of has that. The white arrow tool, because if I grab that, this one stays in place, and I can affect one side of the curve. Okay. If I want to grab the whole path, I use the black arrow tool. So between the black arrow tool, the white arrow tool, and your, um, what do you call it, your pen tool, you have a lot of options. Pretty great. So once we have this path, we're going to go here, and I'm going to use my path selection tool. There are quick keys for all this stuff if you want to learn quick keys. Anybody into quick keys? Yeah, I'm not so into quick keys. All right. 
So uh, what I'm going to do is, what am I going to do? I'm going to go down here and I option click or right click on the path and I'm going to create a vector mask, which does that. So now I've extracted the shape, which is pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool, right? Looks good, decent, right? Love ship, love ship. And I'm going to uh, create a solid color. Again, there are many ways of doing everything in Photoshop, but I am going to create a solid color. And then I'm just going to grab this and drag it up here. So what I've done is I've applied my shape now to the solid. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's a vector, which is pretty awesome because if I want to load up this path, I can copy and paste it into Illustrator. I can use it in After Effects, and it's still vector-based. So here we go. So we got that, and let's go to Transform. Apple T allows you to transform stuff. If I hit Shift, this is a lot of information, I know. If I hit um, Shift, it conforms the proportions or maintains the proportions. If I hit Shift Option, it not only maintains proportions, but it scales based on the center point. All right, so th there'll be a certain amount of practicing. Now, next, um, you know, we'll pick a font. Love ship. Well, I think love ship is pretty um, personal. I don't know. Call me crazy. Mm -hmm. It's intimate. So what we want to start is we want to get love ship to be uh, properly scaled and stuff. So text tool basically click into the main body of the of Photoshop. I kind of did stuff without telling you what I was doing, so let me start again. So your text tool. Text tool is your friend. Horizontal text is the way to go. Vertical text is really awkward, so I wouldn't go there. Um, and the mass tools don't worry about at this point. So text tool, type it in, load, ship. I did all caps before. And then we have to figure out, well, what font do we want to use, right? Let's pick one. So let's see what we have here. Now we have a lot of fonts here. And what I would say about the fonts in here, we've got the Adobe collection, so we've got a lot of classic fonts. I happen to know that I want something that's kind of classical. So I'm going to go with Adobe Garamond Pro. It's a serif font. I already know it's a serif font just because I use it a lot, um, <coughs> which means it has these little feet on it. Now, the little feet come from when type was made out of lead, and it was hand carved or hand printed. And the little feet made text easier to read because you have a little more shape to grab onto with your eye. So typically, like if you see books, if you're reading a long book, you know, War and Peace, because right, we all do that all the time, you typically see the body copy of a book done with a serif font. Right? But in this case, I still want to have that kind of, I don't know, attachment to the handwritten, the intimate, the printed. So I'm going to make the ship darker. It's a heavy weight of Adobe Garamond Pro. Because I have a heavy weight next to a lightweight, I can actually get rid of the space. Now it's the love ship. Right? And if I double click on it, or actually I'm just going to Apple T it again to do a transform, which is also under edit, retransform. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger to create an alignment, which we didn't talk about alignment, but I want to create an alignment where it looks like the the boat is sitting on the love. And you're like, what? Boats don't sit on love. <laughs> OK, so we have love ship. Now we have a problem, which is that my, um, my what do you call it? My ship, thank you. My shape, my ship shape, huh? um, is off angle on the bottom. I could go with this a couple different ways. One is I could take the path and open up the transform again, and by Hovering over one of the corners, I can get the rotate tool going. I could try and hand rotate it. That would be one way of doing it. All right, so I get a nice even line at the top. But what I think I want to do is I just want to make a quick, what do I want to do? I'm going to make a mask. I want to make a mask. I want to make a shape. There are just so many choices, right? So I'm going to create a rectangle. So these are our shape tools. I'm going to make a white rectangle. So I'm selecting the color except I grabbed the wrong thing. I need to grab, let's do it on a new layer so I can draw. 
shape, white, yes, good. I'm going to come in and just do that, except it's not white, so let's reverse it. Color, white, thank you. And there we go. So that's what you are going to do. How do we do that? You got to grab an image. So everybody go now, and I'll take you, go, we'll go step by step together. But you're going to grab your image, grab something iconic, only one. So if it's a microphone, grab a microphone. If it's a film can, make it a film can. If it's a film can, make it a film can. <laughs> Right. So let's grab an object. This is practice. Uh, Google, then you go to Google Images, Advanced Image Search. And what's cool about Advanced Image Search is you can search large, medium, or icon, or even just set up like base larger thans. So if I said, hey, I want it to be larger than 1024 by 768, which is probably a good thing. Then I could go in and say, all right, like I want a cruise ship. And it'll only bring back images at a minimum of that scale. Make sense? Then don't pick graphics, pick photographs so that we can practice. Pick something that's photographic as a starting point. So once Photoshop is loaded up or opened, Maybe we should go to Window, Workspace. Where'd it go? Oh, I'm in the wrong application, that's why. Window, Workspace, Reset Essentials. That way, everybody will have the same view of Photoshop. Once you're there, go File, Open. So File, Open. And you can open your cruise ship. I mean, not your cruise ship, your image. Sorry. I'm like, oh, it's called cruise ship. <laughs> open up your love ship. Where were the inspirations for that? I was like, I don't know. I was thinking of the office one day was love ship. Love ship. Well, I was like, oh, we could do the love boat. And I was like, no, nah, we'll just do love ship. Yeah, love boat, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I was. <laughs> oh. It's actually because I'm working on a cruise ship project right now, so. Oh, I see. So this is all fun. <laughs> yeah, I wish. It's not a commercial project. By the way, you guys should check out. Uh, yeah, exactly. Loveship.com. Love Loveship. <laughs> okay. Once you have your image open. Everybody, you got your. Everybody have their image open in Photoshop. Yeah. You want to do a save as, so you can save it as a PSD. And again, you can save that to the desktop if you want. You do file, save as, Photoshop. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's a Pixar. It's a file format that they use in. I don't know if they use it in RenderMan, but they. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they do have tools that they've built that you know for rendering and for animation. So. Okay. So everybody have a PSD. Yeah. All right. Once you've got your PSD, then what we're gonna do is you're going to duplicate your background layer, just so you have that background, that extra copy. Cool. So you take that background and just pull it down onto the new layer icon. All right, right there to there. Everybody do that? Yep. All right. Once you've done that, you can turn off the background layer because you don't need it anymore. And you can relabel layer one just so you have a layer one. Make sense? All right, next. I'd like you to try and do an adjustment layer just so you have an experience with adjustment layers. 
So down here it's the black and white cookie. Hue and saturation is where you will adjust your saturation all the way down to nothing. So right there. You can also go into layer, new, uh, can you do it here? You can, where'd it go? Layer, new adjustment layer. You can do it up here as well. Because again, in Photoshop, usually there's a menu option and there's an icon option and they're quickie. So there are at least three ways of doing pretty much everything. So this is the other place. Right? Layer, new layer, human saturation. When you click on it, you should have a black and white image. Have you ever had a black and white image? No, no, no. We'll slow it down. Two options right here. Yep. So if you do the hue and saturation, what you should. That's awesome. Um, so, hue and saturation right there. I got the hue human. <laughs> no. like, what? Right. And then right here is your saturation. Right? Awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. All right. So everybody has a black and white image, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay, cool. So next, what you're going to do is you're going to start working with your pen tool. Again, you're going to select your pen tool and you start at wherever your beginning is for your object. Now, the film wheels are a little bit more complex. I know. <laughs> because you're going to make the circle, but then you have to make all the interior shapes as well. Yeah. But that's OK. So for example, for those of you who just have a silhouette with no internal shapes, start at one corner of your object and just start working with your Beziers. If you don't get them perfect, don't worry about it because we can go back and fix them. But what you want to do is drop enough points where you will be able to make the shape. Yeah, yeah just regular tool, yeah. Maybe a pen tool. Is there a perfect circle match with an after Uh, mm, Good question. Yeah, I think you can do shapes and then do a vector shape. So if we go over here, up here, to a path, you can make circle paths. So, so for example, for you guys, it's a little bit different. But if I said I want to grab a ellipse tool under shape, your shape tools are a little confusing. I, I find them a little confusing because you can either use them to create vectors or pixel-based fills. So once you select the circle or the ellipse, then we have to go over here and tell it that, hey, we want a path, which is the middle option. Then you create a circle. You're going to do that circle by um, hitting shift. The shift will make it stay as a perfect circle. right? And you might have to move back and forth between that and your path selection tool to actually line this guy up. Did you see that over here, how I was doing it? So I used the path selection tool to reposition it after I made it. And if I want to transform it, I can make it a little bit bigger. So here it's a little bit bigger. You're making a lot of mistakes. OK, I will be right over there. Once I have the first shape, so for you guys doing multiple paths, okay. if you're doing multiple paths, you're going to want to go to your path panel and save your path so it's not work path. So if, you, if you're doing the film reel, look, look up here for a sec. <coughs> if you're doing the film reel, what you're going to end up seeing, oops, rather, is that I've got one path right here. Once I made the path, I go over to paths and I rename it. Why? Because if I want to make another path, let's say I want to capture this guy as a second circle. Yeah. I need to make sure, let's see, actually, I'm going to have to duplicate, I'm going to have to create a new path. And then create the circle here. So you're going to have to make multiple paths. It gets a little bit more complex. 
sorry. And I just want to point out that you can go in and make a shape like this. So I've got a shape right here. And if I select all of it, you can see, hey, it's like really pointy. But I can go in with my tool here, and I can convert. If I use my convert point tool, so if anybody needs to make conversions from things that are bezier versus angled, <coughs> you want to use this convert point tool. And once you roll over or scroll over a non bezier point, you click on it, and now it's going to create beziers. In addition, if I want to convert it back, I just click over it. Does that make sense? Yeah. How do you activate the tool again? The tool is one of these hidden tools. So it's the bottom one under your pen tool. Okay. So that's how you master the that's how you master the beziers. So if everybody has their shape, what you can do is use your Let's see, your path selection tool and select your path. So I'm using my black arrow, selecting the path, option clicking on it, and I'm going to create a vector mask. Yeah, it's going to look like I'm on the wrong layer. Got to make sure you're on the right layer. Here we go. Create vector mask. I'm going to order it up right. Um, so, let's see here. If you want to undo stuff too, there's a history window. And you can go back in time. So, I'm here, right, on the history window. I make sure that I'm selecting the layer that I actually want to select. And actually, you know, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than I did it before. Um, just because I think it is probably more useful. I'm going to create, now that I have this path, that was based on nothing, but make believe it was based on the ship. Right? I'm going to create a solid. And it instantly makes my shape. And what I'll do too, I'm going to open up my other cruise ship. So if I have my, my path selected, so I've got my cruise ship path, yeah. I can create a solid color. Cool. Let's make it black, because I know I want it to be black. And once I do that, the solid color instantly fills the path. It's a little bit faster than what I showed you before, which before what I did is I extracted the cruise ship like this. And then I created a new solid layer and copied or dragged the path onto that layer. So this is even faster. So has anybody made a little silhouette? Once you've made the silhouette, turn off your background layer. So it goes all white. Great. So iconographic, or an icon, a black icon with black typography. Hopefully what you've learned how to do is to a design process. This would be the sketch stage. So for each of you, I would, you know, if you were in my class, I'd be expecting that you'd do maybe another four or five of these at this stage. You would refine the shapes. You'd come up with four or five different type treatments, and then you would be presenting those. And then we'd have a critique. You'd revise them. And then you'd start applying them. 